So welcome to the Mal and Johnny Show. And Johnny, you've got a very special guest this week. Now, when I first knew Stephen Baltimore, he was a rock and roll singer. Then all of a sudden, he kept on going to London. Uh, he's joined <laughs> us today. I'm from Swansea, I, I would have probably thought. So welcome to the Mal and Johnny Show, Steve. Lovely to be here, Mal and Johnny. Thanks for how are you? How are you, Steve? <laughs> Doing well. Yeah, Doing I'm feeling well. quite. I'm feeling quite bald. I'm the only one without a beard. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, and yeah. what, a, what a lovely colour, Steve. Obviously, we can tell we're the indoor writers, while Johnny's out there making the most of the sunshine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm the. I'm the palest by far today for this. <laughs> I call it Johnny Mahogany Tudor, I call him. Johnny Mahogany. Yeah, I've been, I've been swimming today in the sea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are you be, Very nice. Are I'm going to go later. Yeah, because you've got later. the kids and everything, you know, and, they, and they're growing up at, at a pace, aren't they? Are you, are you able to enjoy the sunshine this summer? I've had a little bit. We've, You know, it's been a funny old, <laughs> funny old everything, isn't it, for the last however long. Mm. But I've been getting out and walking along the beachfront and... I'm going to go down and do an outdoor yoga thing today. I'm a bit of a hippie on the quiet. So uh, <laughs> down by the old observatory in Swansea, they do outdoor yoga oh, wonderful. all the way through oh, wow. the summer. I, that- I saw them doing Tai Chi in, in uh, Shanghai once. All the old blokes are doing all this. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah, very good. Very good for you, all that. All, yeah. Shifting yeah. the energy around your body. And I did a lot of martial arts as a kid, see, Mal and Johnny. I did, I did karate for 20-odd years. So oh, I did, sure. I can. I did short account. I didn't. I didn't do it for long. I got beat up a few times. I gave it up. But it, <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it yeah, kept me. You know, got me fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, yeah, it's, I'm it's a black belt in fantastic. black belt in origami. So, uh, right yeah. now, then now in you boys, because you, obviously you two know each other as well. Uh, how did you? Because like you were speaking last well, week. Well, I, I only met him once. Right, really? I only met Steve once, and I think that was when you did. Um, it was the BAFTAs, I think. That's right. And I heard, right. and you sang just a piano, and you did the Gethsemane song, and it blew me away. And there were some wow. noisy buggers in the bloody audience. I had a go at them because they were talking when you were singing. <laughs> I remember that. I remember, you know, it, and with the Jesus Christ Superstar, because that's that's a hell of a song to oh, sing. Yeah. And to spark it in the middle of a of a of an evening like that was quite a hard thing to do. But you know, we, we had to. You know, as part of the part of the. Um, the journey with that musical part, I think, yeah. over the years. And, and I think song, I performed it, that in, in some very strange places oh, well, we'll, over we'll the pick, years. We'll pick up on that now, because it, it, it was like a song that was written for you. I mean, I, I should explain to Johnny just before we started. You, that's the way you sing, isn't it? You know, that song, Gethsemane, which everybody says, how on earth does he sing like that? That's how you sing. Yeah, well, I grew up listening to Ian Gillen, who originated the part, and... People like Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin. I love Ozzy Osbourne and Ronnie James Dio and all these kind of rock singers. I just loved all that stuff growing up. And all of the kind of high screaming falsetto stuff was really in, in my voice, you know, mm. then. I think everything's gone south <laughs> since then, Johnny, I've got to be honest. As it does, Johnny. <laughs> but, um, Everything goes south eventually, Johnny, doesn't I can it? Only, I can only get up to F sharp, you know. <laughs> I, I don't even know what that is, but, I, yeah. you know, but um. Yes, yeah, so all of that kind of kind of high intensity rock singing was in, in my voice. And there was a, a fella in Swansea called Stuart Leary, lovely songwriter from Penland. And he had me join his band. And it was kind of the days of that kind of hair metal stuff. It was kind of the mid eighties, kind of mid to late eighties. And I just started singing in bands and I just had that kind of height in my voice. So Stuart wrote these bunch of songs and we were in a band down here called After Dark and they had a bit of a following around Swansea. And, and around South Wales. And all of that stuff, we used to kind of do covers and a few covers, but mostly his songs, but they were all very kind of rangy with all that kind of falsetto screaming stuff. So when it came to auditioning for the part eventually, that was kind of, de- that was in my voice. That was the easiest part. It was the acting stuff I had. I'd never had any training in. So it was all, all of that was a very new experience to me. But the singing part, that that was that, that wasn't a problem, and because I've been singing in bands, I used to play clubs and pubs around Swansea. It kind of builds up a resilience. So, the eight shows a week, you know, mm. after singing a couple of hours of screaming rock songs, it, it was it wasn't too bad on on the old voice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, did they say luck is is opportunity meeting preparedness? Is that the right way around? Something like that. It's all very well singing in pubs and clubs around South Wales. But I just remember, because I would think I was doing an afternoon show from Swansea in those days for the BBC, and I, you, I, I, right, every so often yeah. I'd bump into you just outside the BBC and you'd be walking to the station. i say, oh, Steve, you know, how's, how's, how's the band going? Yes, I'm just off to London. And 
suddenly the name Andrew Lloyd Webber kept on coming up in the conversations. I mean, how did that yeah. connection happen from... Because one is a long way, isn't it, from, from everywhere sometimes? Yeah, well, my, my, my kind of uh, journey, if you like, that's a stranger word, but I was in art college in Swansea studying for a degree in art, and I had a particularly bad breakup with this girl, decided to leave art school because she was still there, and I started being a piano removal for a couple of years, working with my friend Ian Marvelli, who I was in a band with. He had shifter removals. And um, a friend of mine, Johnny Hodge, was trying to audition for Leith College Performing Arts course. And he called me and said, would I come and sing Bohemian Rhapsody? Because he was, he was going to audition as a guitarist to get on the course. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll come and sing that. So I remember going and Alan Good, who passed away a few years ago, who was a lovely musician and teacher and instigator of good stuff. Good drinker as well, Al. <laughs> um, we during the audition, he said, "Hey, you sound you sound good. You sound this sounds great, man. Do you want to come and do the course?" And I went, "Yeah." So I I joined the course kind of by accident at Neath College, and was literally there a few months. And during the, the first few months, we put on a performance of Jesus Christ Superstar, and I I had a oh, there's so many weird synchronicities, Mal and Johnny, weird twists of fate and that I could talk about. It's so weird, the whole thing. Years before, I'm just going to go back up a couple of years, we'd, we'd moved down to Bournemouth, a uh, pool, but I was in, um, my dad had a job in Bournemouth and we lived in pool for a couple of years. And I went to this school called Henry Harbin and I remember going into a religious education class one day and the teacher played Jesus Christ Superstar, the film version with Ted Neely. And I remember watching it, think, you know, and I'd never seen a musical before. We didn't grow up in a particularly musical household. Um, so I was kind of looking at the thing, go, what, people are singing at each other? And they, they were all kind of hippies dancing. I couldn't get my head around it. But I remember seeing the guy, Ted Neely, playing Jesus. And I thought to myself, I'm going to meet that dude one day. And I had, no, you know, I was about 12 years of age. And I thought, I'm going to meet this guy. There was some sort of future memory or something very weird. Anyway, going back to, to, um, to college, we did a... A version of we did a performance of Jesus Christ Superstar, and they said, "Oh, you're going to be Jesus." And at the same time, the teacher of piano and singing, Rian, said to me, "Why do you learn these couple of songs?" Um, I'd started dating this other girl, and she knew this girl, and she said, "If you sing this song, this girl and her mum are going to love it." And I was like, "Yep, yeah, I'm all in." So they taught me bring him home from Les Misérables because I sound or sounded a bit like um, Colm Wilkinson, the guy who originated the role. I got that kind of floaty, falsetto thing in my voice. So I remember it was on one of those old cassette recorder, you know, the piano cassette recorders. Rian played the, the piano, and I took it home and sang it for my girlfriend at the time and her mum, and they both started crying, and I thought, whoa. And they were like, this, this sounds great. Anyway, we did the version. We did our week at the, at the Gwyn Hall of... Um, Jesus Christ Superstar. And I remember, because part of Neath College was a sports science college and there's big rugby guys. And they were dragged along with their girlfriends to see it. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing some doing some of the scenes. I remember looking out at the audience and these big kind of rugby boys were all, were all weeping in their girlfriend's arms. And I thought, this is a powerful thing, man. Yeah. And of course, we were we were talking about the crucifixion, all of this, obviously. But I remember thinking, wow, this this medium is a real powerful thing if you if you get it right and Anyway, on the last, very last performance, on the very last couple of moments when I was uh, in the crucifixion scene, and I remember, I can remember like it was yesterday, it was like, we built the stage with scaffolding and I was up being crucified. I remember looking down, given the lines, who is my mother, where's my mother, and I had this overwhelming sensation that I'd do it again, that I'd play the part again. And again, whether it's a future memory or our lives are mapped out or we're stuck in some sort of matrix and, you know, it's all whatever. It was a very uncanny feeling. And so a few, literally a few weeks after that, um, Rian in one of our lessons said, look, there's an open audition for Les Miserables in the stage. Why didn't you go for it? I said, yeah, what have I got to lose? So I literally got a and, – and the night before we were playing – I think in the, in, in the coach house down on Wine Street and there was a bit of a scuffle and all of that business. So I literally stumbled out of the pub, <laughs> got on a three o'clock, you know, went home, but changed, got on a three o'clock train, got up to London, 
sat in um, McDonald's drinking coffee for a couple of hours, was literally wired to the moon on adrenaline and coffee, on bad coffee, because it was really bad then, it's still bad now, <laughs> and got the first of the queue and went in for an open audition. And it was like everything I'd kind of read about in all, you know, all the kind of cliched, there was a, it was a darkened stage and the people were sitting out in the auditorium, couldn't see them. There were these little angle poised lights and they were shuffling papers. And it's like, yeah, what's your name, Steve? What are you going to sing? And I sang Bring Him Home, which, you know, I didn't know and I, that it's kind of the cardinal sin to go into a musical and sing the lead person's musical at the audition. But I was literally 20 years of age, didn't know my ass from my elbow and just went for it. So I sang that and a guy, you know, and I sang it very like, Colm Wilkinson. It was almost a facsimile of Colm's version. So the guy came up and I'd lied on my CV, said I'd been in Fiddler on the Roof and all these <laughs> things. Really do. I, still have, I, I still haven't seen Fiddler on the Roof or, or you know, you should. It's great. nothing about it's it. It's great. It's a really good show. Is it? I'm sure show. it is. So um, they, this fella came up, Ken Caswell, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, what, what things have you been? And I said, oh, and I couldn't remember what I put on the CV. I said, all those things on my CV. And he was like, yeah, you haven't been in any of them. And I went, no. <laughs> and he's like, well, what's your story? And I said, oh, you know, I, I'm in bands and I'm kind of doing this to kind of impress my girlfriend, really, if I'm really honest. And um, so he said, have you gone anything else? I said, yeah. And, and Rian had written out, handwritten out, Gethsemane. And in our version of Gethsemane, we changed the middle bit. And during the rehearsal for our version in, in, in Leith College, Rian said, wouldn't it be great if we change this bit? And in the middle of Gethsemane, the, the old version, the Ian Gillen version and the Ted Neely version, in the middle, he kind of screams, you know, all right, I'll die. But we changed it. I say, we, Rian changed it. And she kind of wrote the notes in that don't now go, all right, I'll die. Just that. And I go, da, 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 da. And it rises to the big screen. That was Rian's and mine are kind of, but more Rian's little kind of thing. Hmm. So I said to, he said, have you got anything else? I said, yeah, I've got Gethsemane. Have you heard of it? He said, yeah, I've heard of it. <laughs> so I play, so I do Gethsemane and I give it the full tilt, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning when it goes, I give it, I give it the full Hoyle Swansea welcome. So the next thing he comes up again, he says, yeah, yeah, that was good. Come with me. And, I, and I'm in a room with, the kind of money people and the producers and Cameron Macintosh who owns all of the theatres and and that was and that was it. So when I got back to college the next day, they said, "How did it go?" I said, "Oh, I went in a room and I met a couple of people and there was a Scottish named fella." They, what, they said, "What Cameron?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I think that's the fella. Yeah, a little bloke." And, she, and Rian was like, "Bloody hell, he, you know, tell me again what happened." And I was like, "Well, this happened." And they were like, "Well, that's so." I literally on a whim. You know, I had a couple more auditions, and then I was in. I was in the, the first tour in production. It was first in Manchester, and then we went to Edinburgh and Dublin. And that was basically my training. It was 18 months, you know, and watching people who'd been to drama school and people who'd done loads of musicals, and it was just using my wits and, you know, the, the kind of Swansea, uh, what I'd been taught, literally. No, you, know, you, you know the thing about you said about... about um, about the acting bit, I I can empathise with that because when I first musical I did, the director said to me, "Keep your hands still. You're not singing a song <laughs> because you turn to gesticulate <laughs> too much when you're singing." Yeah, so I said, right. "Okay," and he taught me how to act really because I was a singer, you know, and a dancer. Yeah. And funny enough, Cameron McIntosh of that show, he was the stage manager, and I found the program just a like, little bit like that. And I wrote him a letter years later, and I said, I've got the program. And he was so nice, he wrote back, oh, I remember that. He said, I remember that, that show, and I remember the write-up. It said, the best material I saw was when the curtain fell at the end of the show. <laughs> 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 Johnny, you, you know, yeah. You, yeah, you know, obviously musicals up until Jesus Christ Superstar, I suppose, or maybe West Side Story, they were very different things. They were musical comedies, weren't they? Do you do you remember? Because you, you must have been in London when Jesus Christ Superstar, the original one, came out. Yeah, well, as you say, musical comedy. That's right. It was a different ball game. They're more. I think things like Superstar now they're more like rock operas. They're not really musicals. I, I don't think a musical was like Guys and Dolls. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, where there's a lot of chat and but I mean things like well all the Weber stuff really it's like mini like 
well, they're like operas, really, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Don't you think mm-hmm. so? Mm-hmm. So you know, I mean, when yeah. I was in the West End, there was uh, uh, Ali Seekin was across the road in um, the Four Musketeers, right. um, wow. and uh, there was all sorts. There was uh, Judy Dench was playing um, doing cabaret. What? <laughs> she was little Sally Bowles. So that's wow. I'm going back to 1969 now. See, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. You know. I mean, Steve. Then, so you you know you, you you've you've very quickly gone from this room with all these names that you know are are legends now, and uh, and they were pretty big back then. Um, but to to open in London in the West End, because at that stage your face was on every bus, wasn't it? You you know wa- you walking in the full robes, walking through a, a modern city, and you were the, you were the face of Jesus. Yeah, so I came back to Swansea in the meantime and put my band back together because at the end of the um, the Les Mis run, they were they were auditioning for Martin Guerre that was coming into town, and they, they were all, you know everybody in the in the cast was offered a, uh, an audition and, a, and and I didn't fancy it, you know. I said I'm going to go back to Swansea. <laughs> I know I it sounds so crazy it. now, yeah, yeah. but I went, yeah, thanks so much. We had a lovely time. I put on three stone drinking Guinness in Dublin. I said I'm going to go back go to the gym for a while and, uh, and and put my band back together. So I came back. And then a few years later, one of the fellas who was in the cast, a guy called Jonathan Greatorex, uh, had given up acting and singing himself. And he'd become an agent because he was so um, bothered, I think is the right word, by everybody's kind of, everyone was saying, oh, God, my agent's doing nothing. He was like, well, I could do this. Mm. And he eventually became one of the biggest agents in London. He re- retired early, and but uh, he was just fantastic. So he called me a couple of years later and said, hey, listen, um, they're auditioning for Superstar. My brother Andy call- had called me the same day and said, I'd just seen it on the telly. They're auditioning for Superstar. Um, and I thought, well, this is one of those coincidences again. I'm going to take a listen to this. So Johnny said, come up come up to Guildford and have, do you still know that song, Gethsemane? I said, yeah, yeah I think so. So I we went up to, and sang it in his front room. He was like, right. He got on the phone to... Um, the guy who casts a lot of Andrew's shows still, I think, a guy called David Grinrod, and said, um, look, if you see Steve, you're going to cast him, which is a big, <laughs> that's a big talk. Yeah. So a couple, week or so later, I was in auditioning for David, and um, I sang Get Sam, and he, literally to him, and a guy playing, was playing the piano, and he started to cry, and, and I thought, there's a pattern emerging here. <laughs> so, and then that began my journey of the, of the 14 auditions or so over the year, you know, which was, uh, and then, Right on the last audition, they brought in a guy called Subin Vala, who was playing Romeo for the RSC at the time at the National, and uh, who was this amazing kind of, he could do everything, man. He could play piano like a, like a beast. He could sing like a beast. And he was a brilliant actor. So they brought him in right to the last audition, and there was this lovely chemistry, and it just worked, right? I instantly thought, God, this, this, this is some sort of, he was quite a force of nature. So, so I remember after that audition, he said, what do you think, mate? I said, I think we got the gig, dude. And, I, and uh, he said, how do you know? I said, well, I've, I've done this like for the last year and I, I just got a feeling. And we both got the gig. So then began the, the, the kind of rehearsal process, which, you know, again, for me, I'd, I'd had like 18 months literally learning a couple of years previously on Les Mis, but I had had no training at all, right? And and it was about being in the right place at the right time. My hair was long. I looked like the archetypal Western idea of Jesus, I think, and I could sing the songs but without a problem. So they took a chance right at the end. They took a chance for me. And so, the, you know, literally the rehearsal process, that eight weeks that we had, was one of the biggest learning curves in my life, you know. And the director we had, Gail Edwards, which looking back, you know, 20-something years ago, having a woman direct a, a big, you know, big money musical like that was a, was a big cool thing for Andrew to do at the time. And she was brilliant, bonkers as hell, but really brilliant. And I learned so much. And again, because I, I had my little tape recorder that, and I taped everything. I taped the whole, and I found the old cassettes um, while I was, you know, during lockdown, we all had to clean out and decorate the places. Surely I'm not the only one. And I cleaned out my garage and found out a load of, a load of those cassettes and I put them back. And the stuff she was saying was so profound and so, you know, it, it had resonance with all aspects of life. But, it, of course, it was to do with the piece and, and what we were trying to do. But it was a hell of a learning learning curve. And then the opening night, and i tell you something I was thinking about the other day, was my martial arts background really helped me because I did so much 
training in karate back in the day, and I had no real formal training in, in acting. But I remember Sparky Parkhouse and John Wood, my two instructors, they used to be at the old um, leisure center in Swansea. You do you do like hundreds and hundreds of you know doing the the stuff the up and down the lines, the characters, and you do all the kind of. And I used to do loads of competition fighting. I remember Sparky saying to me, "You've done all this. You've done all the training now. Just go and just go and be." And I remember at the time, like a 16, 17 year old kid, I was like, "What are you really talking about?" He mm. said, "You've done it all. Just go and do what you do." And I'm like, "Whoa!" And I remember that the opening night of Superstar. I remember his old hmm. Sparky's words were resonating in my ear, going, "We've done all. Just go and be what." Do what do what you do. So I literally went out and didn't do much at all. Really, I <laughs> just kind of let it kind of carry me along. And it, it, it was, and that's, I swear, it's the old martial arts training of, you know, just be in the moment and do all that sort of stuff. It was, uh, yeah. But it was a hell hell of an experience, Mal yeah. and Johnny. It was, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it was a wake up call. I tell you, <laughs> I knew it was alive. You know, you say about making people cry. It always reminds me of an old joke about the guy singing in the club. You know. And he comes to the end and he's singing my hen lad van And there's a guy in the front and he's crying his eyes out. He said, You're a Welshman? He said, No, I'm a musician. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, but see Elvis, I mean yeah. you take Elvis, he's always doing martial arts on stage. People don't realise that's yeah. what he's doing. Yeah. He's doing a massive man. Elvis man. I mean, I when, I big, saw, when, when I saw him doing yeah. the, the, um, the American trilogy, another song that blew me away. The oh way my god, I love it. that song. I know it was done by uh, Mickey Newbery first. He's That's the one right. that actually put it together. But Elvis is, I don't know what, I mean, you can't say Elvis was the greatest singer in the world, but he had charisma. And he had this, you know, I don't know, the way he sang that, it'd make the hair go about up the back of your neck. Yeah. Do you know, John, I put that on, every time that comes on, I've got to stand up and, and salute it every yeah. single time. And at the end, when he goes to that note, then he nearly gets there. Yeah. But it's like, oh, it's just... It's just incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I love that song so much. Um, oh, you know, fantastic. obviously, it's eight shows a week. Johnny, you did that in, in your West End yeah. career, and you've done it in theatre as well. That is an incredible strain on your your voice, your body, your head, your, you know, your whole mentality, particularly if you're playing Jesus. I mean, you know, what, whatever people think about the character, this character's played a big role in many millions of people's lives for 2,000 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did that, did it? Did things happen? I mean, I was just wondering, did, you know, did you feel, did you feel the spirit? I, I did actually, Mel. I got to be honest with you. And I know you're a religious man, and I definitely felt something going on. Mm. Definitely, mm. Yeah. you know, the, the eight shows a week thing. That that's kind of you, you got to stay in shape, and you got to. I didn't drink. I don't smoke, but I didn't drink for a year. Liters and liters of water, just to keep everything hydrated and warming up and warming down. All those technical things, which are super, super. Um, you know, not staying out, not going out, because. Mm. <laughs> Going out to parties and kind of shouting over people that will kind of make your voice tired yeah, and yeah. get you into some problems and all that. So I was very, very mindful. And I, you know, when I was young, and of course, when you're younger, your voice can do other, you know, lots of things we can't do as we get older, obviously. But I was very mindful. I thought, so I've got this gig. I'm one of the luckiest people around. I've won this gig. I, I, I want to I wanna kind of take care of it. And I remember Andrew wrote me a letter again. I found it during the lockdown. And he said some beautiful things in this, in this letter. But he also said, um, You've got a beautiful instrument, or I'm paraphrasing, and please take care of it. I remember thinking, no, I will do that. I'm going to really take care of it. And I have all these years. I mm -hmm. still warm up every day and warm down yeah. and do all yeah. that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I did, I did feel, I did feel something move, Mal. I got to be honest, because you, you know, even if you're not religious, and even if you subscribe to the idea that Jesus might not have been, he might be an amalgamation of several different kind of pagan god type ideas, and and all, you know. Even so, 2,000 years of people believing in something, yeah. I believe, will have an effect on on something. It's, it's almost like thought will create it, and and so so I was very aware a few times of some of some really interesting kind of strange phenomena that went on, and yeah, it was very very it's, odd. Yeah, it's but, funny you say. I went to Israel once. I was I was working on a cruise ship, and uh, I went to Nazareth and all these places. I'm not particularly. I'm not. And I don't know what I am really. I think I'm a daytime atheist. But <laughs> 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 night I say my prayers. No. And I, when I was there, it, <laughs> it makes you think you've got this like two thousand years of. And I was in I was in the Garden of Gethsemane with, and the trees wow. are that old. Mm -hmm. And you think, what the heck, you know? Yeah. They, and it does get you. You see, yeah. I mean, yeah, I unbelievable. Do you know what you're saying about looking after your voice? I met a fellow called Victor Moan. Do you know? Remember Victor Moan? He was a 
It's the one Sinatra said, if God could sing, he'd sound like Victor Monk. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Anyway, he, he was a friend of Pavarotti. And he said to Pavarotti once, he said, it must be great owning a voice like that. And Pavarotti said, no, the voice owns me. Yeah. And he had to look after it because if he didn't, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I remember, but especially you don't realize classical, what you got to do. No, but when you're with a singer, you've got to look after it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went yeah, to see, I went to see Steve. I went to see Steve in the. It was the Lyceum, I suppose, wasn't it? Was the Lyceum? Yeah, yeah. And um, it, was, it was a fantastic performance. Obviously, you know I'm a big fan, uh, on and off camera, and uh, and at the end. Yeah. I, I mean, I always tell, I often tell this story if I'm doing a concert or something, you know, because you gave me the thumbs up, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, That's right. Because, uh, no, can you remember what it was? I mean, I remember the story is this, so I might be making it up. I remember you saying you knew I was in the house. You were looking at me all the way through the show. I could see show. you. I could see you. It, and you got up on I the cross and there I was, you know. And actually, from a spiritual point of view, I've often thought about that. I got up on the cross and there I saw you, Maldrin. You know, so, um, and then I went back yeah. afterwards and you were in your dressing room, you know, because this, it's this intense experience. The music is enormous and the story's enormous. And it's, yeah. you know, it's Judas rather than Jesus, isn't it? You know, that's, and it's yeah, like yeah, all this yeah. stuff going in your head if you come from a church background and I walked in and there was Jesus with baby wipes wiping wiping the blood off him it was just so wiping the blood every day you got covered in blood didn't you Jesus well, was, gave you the thumbs up he did from the cross <laughs> it the, the, it was, it was, it was just like that it was amazing it was amazing <laughs> and and you remember Mal our, we had everyone in the cast was just killer man mm. we had people come from the RSC and some some just well, just everybody was stellar. They, mm. they had the pick of the crop and everybody was just on fire. It was just, and everybody could do any part. You know, when you see <laughs> people in shows being swings and being understudies, they can all do, they can all do the equally mm. as good. It's just that something happened that, mm. uh, you know, I had a lucky, lucky loincloth, they used to call it. I look good in a loincloth <laughs> back in those days. I think that's what, that's what won me the part. But, um, we had, it was it was so visceral and violent the whipping scene in particular, and there was, I remember that I had ropes on my hands and I had to hold the ropes, and because it was in a circular, on a circular stage, to, I had my arms pulled apart by these ropes, and everybody doing the whipping scene when pilots kept counting, somebody would hold this chalice which was filled with blood. Um, a mixture of molasses and and real you know real blood <laughs> molasses and fake blood and then they kind of take handfuls of it and come and slap it across my body and so i was literally covered in blood at the end and it was such you know and the lights were blaring they had a white light blaring so it was just mm. beautifully done and it was balletic but very very kind of horribly Violent be- as yeah, well. Horribly beautiful. That was the thing. It was it, it was, was horribly beautiful. It was beautiful. It was, but it was beautiful. just like it, every every whip you know, yeah, made you cry. It, was, it was, yeah, it was, and then of course, and then the cross would have been on stage for a while, and then it was, oh god, and the way they, the crucifixion, the way they did the crucifixion, when they literally, literally put me on the cross, nailed me, and then they kind of raised me up with these ropes. It was just, mm. and there was one, there was one night where the the kind of the way that the um, the cross fit in the floor, it kind of slipped out. So the cross was literally falling forward. And there was a guy in the cast called Philip Farentino, who was about six foot seven. He was built like a, yeah. he was like an Adonis, just this huge kind of muscle guy. And he came and shoved his shoulder in and stopped the thing from falling forward. Goodness oh, wow. Goodness Honestly, it was, it was just, and then they managed to kind of write it and put it in and all of that. But it was, yeah. I, I still have nightmares about that because I wouldn't have been able to do anything. I was tied in. But it would been like that. Good night. Yeah. Why did you stop? But, um, Why? Yeah. I mean, I know the show came, well, no, the show kept on going and it went to Broadway. Why did you stop? Well, because, you know, 400 crucifixions was quite enough mm-hmm. for a start. Um, they, they wanted me to carry on. And there were a few things at the time. Um, I'd been off. The only reason I tried to get the gig originally, when, when, I, when Johnny called me that day and said, hey, they're auditioning for Superstar, do you want to go? He, he said, what do you want to do? What, what's your plan? What do you like to find mm-hmm. your plan? I said, well... I've been writing songs and I want to get signed by Sony. That's what I said. And uh, literally, he said, okay, let's try and work something out. And then he said, look, he said, it's a long shot, but if you get this gig and, and you're as good as I think you could be in it, I think I think record companies will come to you. And I said, well, let's give it a whirl. You know, the naivety of youth. Right? Mm-hmm. When you think about it now, what a 
gargantuan <laughs> hill to climb. But I said, yeah, let's give it a whirl. So I did all that. And literally in three months, I think Universal came down off of their gig, Polydor from their gig, which is the company Andrew was with. And Sony came. And uh, I, I signed the Sony record. So I was literally signed and started working on material for my album during the end kind of the end few months of the show. I was absolutely knackered, mine. But so um, so that kind of that that was kind of that was kind of the main reason why I didn't stay on. I I, I kind of I had somewhere to go, and mm-hmm. so so literally the night that the show finished, we went and did one one extra show in Norway in hell. We did a Jesus Christ Superstar in hell in Norway the night after, and then I, I went down to France for basically a year and started working on my album. Mm-hmm. It came around again a few years later. I was I was asked if I'd go to Broadway and do it on Broadway, but I I just. I was I was in Canada at the time writing and I was just in the flow then of trying to make a record. Mm. And um, you know, looking back, have I got a regret? Maybe it'd have been good to go to go to Broadway, but the show that they took out only lasted a few months anyway and then it got it got slated and so I think I dodged a bit of a bullet with that yeah. actually. Yeah. A lot of fate attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh definitely, Johnny. Well you know, yeah. you've been in, in the game for a long time and the mal as yeah. well. Things things have to be right and that's and right. the timing has to be right, and sometimes luck plays a massive part. But again, as you said, you can make your own luck sometimes. And and but you know, it was a it was just an an amazing time of life. And you know, I'm still talking about it 23 years on or whatever. And yeah. a few years ago, Mal, I got asked um, if I'd do the show again. Uh, Ted Neely, who's now in his 70s, he's still playing Jesus and still being amazing, actually. I was asked if I'd go and become his alternate in um, Holland. So I went out and met him. I didn't do eventually the show, but I took the opportunity to go out and meet Ted Neely. And it was like a full circle from when I was like 12 years of age. He just said, I knew I was going to meet you, dude. I knew it. Mm. So uh, it was, yeah. yeah. So there's been like all the way along, though, there have been these weird coincidences and synchronicities. And, and I do believe, you know, that there is kind of a... There is kind of a blueprint or something that we we kind of come into this life with. Yeah, yeah. You know, Brilliant. I do I do believe that that's it. All right. Well, look, the plan is still going. This is, I think if you if you do have time in future weeks, it would be good to do part two because there's all the music about I the stories. There's Steve yeah. Walton with the artist who's just about to make a brand new record. Well, I say that every time I talk to you. Um, and you've got you've got a new band with uh, you know, Andy Collins and Pete Riley. So there's lots of stuff going on in your life. But thanks for sharing your your first part of the story. It's an amazing story, isn't it? The boy well, from, fantastic. Thank you, doing, yeah. doing the pubs yeah, and clubs and then suddenly on the West End in, in that role and... Uh, and uh, we're killing it absolutely hey Stevie B speak to you soon and Johnny thank you Mal yeah, thank you Johnny so goodbye from all me all the best Steve yeah. great day from you fantastic thank you guys thanks see you soon bye 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 bye